Um, let me share my screen. All right, let me share my screen to start. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, this, excuse me, uh, this session is being recorded for educational purposes, um, just so everyone knows. And uh, welcome to this session of the MGFC Family Centered Care Series at Mass General for Children, where pediatric health experts share their knowledge on various pediatric health and family related topics. Uh, this year, we're collaborating on the series with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. And before we, we begin, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping items. Um, the session is being recorded for educational purposes, as I mentioned. Um, if you'd like to view the recording, please visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org slash Blum hyphen center. This session is in listen only mode so we can hear our guest speaker today. And if you have questions, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Only the Blum Center staff, the co-host and the guest speaker will be able to see your questions. Uh, please do not ask any medical, uh, um, excuse me, please don't provide any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. Uh, if you have personal medical questions, please speak to your doctor about those. Um, and lastly, at the end of our session, you'll see a brief survey to collect uh, feedback on the session and help us better plan future programs. All right, and today uh, we have Dr. Michael Flaherty to share evidence-based strategies to help keep teen drivers safe and to share emerging strategies for parents and families to help their new drivers. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Flaherty. Uh, he is a pediatric critical care physician and injury prevention researcher here at Mass General. He is also the site director of the Injury Free Coalition at, for Kids at Mass General and the program director of the Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship Program here at the hospital as well. He studies the epidemiology of many preventable injuries, including motor vehicle crashes in teenagers with a particular interest in distracted driving. And at the end of the session, Dr. Flaherty will be addressing questions. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box and we'll have time for them later. And from here, I will hand it over to our speaker. Thank you so much, Brianna. And thank you again to the Blum Center for having me back. And I apologize to any of those who um, missed my first two reschedulings of this, but here we are. Um, and actually it's the end of April and April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. So it's a perfect time to talk about the teen driver and in particular to talk about the teen driver in an era and an age where they are more distracted than ever. Um, so I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. And for the next hour, and, and I'll probably speak for 45 minutes or so and leave some time to have a discussion or answer some questions, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the statistics. Um, some of these numbers are quite frightening, but there's some hope in here as well. We'll talk about the risks. What are those risks to our teen drivers? And with those risks and with the problems, what are some of the potential solutions? Um, and what can we do about it as parents, um, as healthcare professionals, um, as people who are advocates for our children and our adolescents? How can we think about this problem and make sure everyone remains safe out there on the road? So with that, we talk and start with the teen license. Um, this is a milestone in, in all teenagers' lives. Um, it's a rite of passage. It's sort of that transition into autonomy where they finally can get themselves to and from uh, sporting events and activities and friends things. Um, it's also a terrifying time um, for, uh, for parents, um, as many of you watching and listening today um, have either experienced or will experience. Um, and with that comes great responsibility, both for the teen driver uh, and for us as parents and as health professionals. So some of the statistics, new drivers, um, novice drivers, which we define in, in the research realm as those with less than 18 months of experience, they have four times the risk of crash or near crash events. Um, for every mile driven, um, 16 and 17 year old drivers have the highest rates of crash involvement here in the United States. And these injuries um, are not only to themselves, but unfortunately affect those who are in the car as passengers, um, and more than ever recently, those outside the car as pedestrians, as cyclists, as, as other people not in vehicles uh, in and around our roadways. 
more than half of eight to 17 year olds um, were killed as passengers um, and they were killed in vehicles being driven by drivers under the age of 18. So not only does this affect our teen drivers, it affects the people in the vehicles with them. Um, this is a slide I love to show in many of my presentations, um, and it's this it's from the CDC. It shows the 10 leading causes of death here in the United States, um, and it's by age group. I'm a pediatrician, so I serve most patients uh, under the age of 21, sometimes uh, as old as 25. And in blue, all across that number one rank um, from about the age of one through the age of 44, the leading cause of death in this country is unintentional injury. And that's really why I'm, I'm so interested in injury and preventing injury. Um, and while I work clinically in the pediatric ICU, my, my wish, my goal is to prevent children from having to come to the ICU by targeting this leading cause of death. If we break down what are those unintentional injury deaths, this slide is a little old. The most recent breakdown of this data occurred in 2018. But if you look, there's a, a bimodal distribution of that light blue, the unintentional motor vehicle traffic deaths. Um, and unfortunately, the leading cause of death in these age groups uh, was just motor vehicle crashes were just surpassed by firearm related injuries, uh, which is also unfortunate and a whole different talk. Um, but unintentional motor vehicle traffic deaths um, and causes continue to be the second leading cause of death for children five to nine, and then again at 15 to 24. And that five to nine age group um, are obviously as passengers. And um, a lot of it relates to who's driving the vehicle, but also child restraint systems and, and the proper use of car seats and child passenger safety seats. And then 15 to 24, it pops up again as our teens are learning to drive. Um, and this is a, a most frightening time, as we mentioned previously. How do we do in the United States when we look at this globally? Um, this slide is from 2016 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it looks at death from motor vehicle crashes um, in co compared to high-income countries, the United States compared to England, Sweden, Hungary, as well as low to middle-income countries. And you'll see that for high-income countries, the United States is unfortunately leading the charge here in terms of mortality from traffic deaths. And the same is true um, even when we compare ourselves to many low to middle-income countries other than Thailand. And so this is a, a very unique uh, problem to the United States for many different reasons um, that we will touch on as we go forward. This slide um, also is, is meant to show some hope. Um, and is also old. This is from 2016. And these are the leading causes of death um, for adolescents in the United States. And when you zoom out, it's, it's really impressive to see that in blue uh, and in orange, the two leading causes of death for children in our country are motor vehicle crashes and firearm related injuries. As we have gone to 2023, these lines have crossed and firearm related injuries have surpassed motor vehicle crashes. But what I want to show here is that motor vehicle crashes are still a significant cause of death in our population. And not only that, but having to have zoomed out on this data um, is able to show not only um, that it's the leading cause, one of the leading causes, but also how much work we've done and how much success we've had in that gigantic drop that we see there from 1999 till about um, 2010, 2011. Um, over the past 25 years, we've been able to reduce teen fatalities and motor vehicle crashes by about 50%. Um, and that's one of the most successful public health um, accomplishments of our time. Um, so we've made a lot of progress. Um, and why? Why have we made that progress? Well, one is that overall traffic-related deaths are decreasing. So as all traffic deaths decrease, so do the proportion of those deaths that are attributable to our teens that are driving on the roads. We obviously have, um, we've made many safety improvements, both um, on our roadways and in vehicles themselves. So we have better seat belts in vehicles. We have the invention of the airbag, both for passengers and drivers, and um, often in newer vehicles for other passengers in the back of the vehicle. All sorts of new vehicle technology, backup cameras, blind spot monitors, things that we're still not, um, from an evidence-based medicine standpoint, certain they've reduced crashes, but anecdotally, we know that they help. And we also know that our roads are safer. We have better traffic laws. We have uh, better roadways throughout the United States uh, and in many uh, urban areas, especially. We also have the advent of a, a concept known as graduated driver licensing, which actually started in New Zealand and made its way to the United States in the early 1990s. And it is the... Um, 
It is the stepwise introduction of how to drive a vehicle um, and restrictions on driving that vehicle to new drivers uh, in a particular state or, or, um, or province. In the United States, every state now has some form of a graduated driver licensing program, um, which typically includes a learner's permit stage and then a stage of intermediate uh, restrictions, which are typically on uh, nighttime driving, on how many passengers are allowed in the vehicle, um, and, and graduated driver licensing has had one of the biggest impacts on reducing teen fatalities. And we'll go into why that is and how we can use graduated driver licensing to help our new drivers. The other fact of the matter is that fewer teens are driving, especially post-COVID. Uh, people are delaying licensure and, and licensed teens, um, even pre-COVID, went from about 85% of 17-year-olds to now about 70%. And that number is likely even lower um, in the post-COVID era. And I bring this graph back up again um, to show that, yes, while we've made significant improvements, um, I mentioned that, um, unfortunately, firearm-related deaths have surpassed motor vehicle crashes, but the line at the tail end also continues to go up in the wrong direction. Um, and the reason for that really is that despite all of the improvements that we've made, um, technology has also, unfortunately, um, been our own, um, our own enemy. These are just a smattering of headlines from Massachusetts involving texting while driving. And as we've introduced new technology into our vehicles, so have we introduced new uh, ways for our teens to be distracted, for the passengers in their vehicle to distract them. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing a, a, an unfortunate increase in, in motor vehicle crash deaths due to the presence of mobile devices in cars, as well as the presence of all sorts of new touchscreens and technology in our vehicles. So what are some of the risk factors? Um, obviously, uh, young age, but, but why specifically when we think about this from a scientific and epidemiological approach? Um, one is inexperience. Um, the other is the presence of passengers. The other is risk taking. We know that adolescents are um, uh, especially prone to, to taking more risks, especially when they don't know the consequence of those risks. Distraction, we've touched on a little bit, um, especially from passengers, but also from the fact that just about everyone now carries a mobile device, and it's typically somewhere in the vehicle that uh, teens are able to see it. Uh, substance use continues to be a risk factor. Um, we've made huge headway in alcohol-impaired driving, especially with um, alcohol impairment laws. Um, and enforcement. Unfortunately, as we legalize marijuana in many states, uh, marijuana cannabinoid products uh, also can impair drivers and they're creating newer problems um, for us to face as public health professionals. Medical concerns as well. We'll touch on um, some medical conditions that put some teens at higher risk um, of, of getting into a crash while driving and how we need to pay particular attention to those teens and help individualize how we train them to drive. So let's go into some of these risk factors and, and dig a little deeper into why they are risk factors and, and think about how we can target them from a public health approach, from a parent approach, um, and from a health professional approach. So inexperience, uh, one is attention and risk. So we know that the adolescent brain is unfortunately immature, and we know that from so many different areas uh, of life, uh, especially for those who care for adolescents or who have them in their home. In terms of driving, the adolescent brain tends to fix attention on individual hazards. They see one thing on the road, they see one thing ahead of them, and they fail to anticipate, to see the, the road at large, to think ahead, to be able to determine what other things in their peripheral vision might impact um, what they do next when driving. Much of that has to do as well with inexperience. It happens to drivers who we know get licensed at later ages, um, but the adolescent brain doesn't help any. Um, delayed licensing has become a huge problem um, as we um, have introduced laws that help teen, teen drivers be slowly introduced to full autonomous driving on our roads. Many of those laws aren't applicable after, um, after people turn 18. And so many people who delay licensure and get a license at 18, 19, they're not subject to the same um, policies, same laws, same training that those between the ages of 16 and 18 are subjected to. Um, and then opportunities for practice vary by teen. We know that um, there aren't a lot of opportunities to practice. A lot of it depends on access to driver education programs, um, on parents' ability to help our teen drivers learn to drive. 
And those opportunities are so important um, in order to, to fix all of these other areas. We talked a little bit about passengers. Um, so why do passengers matter? Um, we know that passengers in the vehicle um, increase the risk of crash through two basic mechanisms. One is distraction. If someone's in the vehicle, they're talking to the teen driver. Um, not only are they now not able to focus on the, their, their periphery to anticipate, but they have to, to think to use the other area of their brain for communication. And there's also peer influence. We know that our peers um, and the presence of a peer in the vehicle might cause a teen to uh, modify their behavior, to take more risks, to not do things they may do when driving alone or that they know to be right, um, as is the case in so many things that our teenagers do. The likelihood of a teen driver being involved in a fatal crash is actually directly related to the number of passengers in the vehicle. And that effect seems to be stronger uh, with male teen drivers. And then we have risk taking and risky driving. So what does that involve? That involves speed. So speed is an independent uh, risk factor for motor vehicle crashes, regardless of age. And teens, uh, depending on the vehicle, depending on who's in it with them or the circumstances, um, just seem to be more likely to drive fast, not obey speed limits. Among fatal crashes um, in teenage drivers, those under the age of 18, speed was a factor in about 36% of those crashes. So despite uh, better motor vehicle traffic laws, not all teens are following them. Um, with lack of inexperience, with risk-taking, um, our teenage drivers also maintain shorter following distances. And we know this from direct visualization studies where they've watched teens drive um, or with uh, kinematic um, sensors in vehicles that are able to sense stopping and braking distance. And, and we know that the shorter the following distance, the more likely they are to get into a rear end collision. Teens are far more likely to drive at night. It's when their activities occur. It's when school and activities end and or the parties or friend gatherings begin. Um, our teenagers are already sleep deprived um, and the adolescent brain is already not great at, at processing. And so driving at night presents all sorts of new challenges in terms of, of risky driving. Um, we talked about those kinematic driving behaviors and then distraction. So distraction comes in three forms. There's visual distraction, things that we see um, in front of us. There's manual distraction. If um, a teen or one of us is driving and we're eating, if we're applying makeup, if we're tuning into the radio, if we're trying to shift the car or something falls, there are manual things that we do that also distract our brain. And there's cognitive distraction. And cognitive distraction is anything that we're thinking about that isn't the road. And that can be caused by um, passengers in the car, by having a conversation, by having a conversation even through a hands-free um, phone conversation in the vehicle that the, the, um, the ability to have to think and, and maintain a conversation and response um, are all cognitive distractions. Our electronic devices that so many of us carry with us present all three types of distraction, right? So we have a screen where we're visually distracted. We have a notification, a text message comes through. Um, we have the manual distraction of trying to enter that address in the GPS of trying to, God forbid, place a phone call. Then we have the cognitive distraction um, of actually, if we're speaking or thinking about what to text or talk on the phone. And so really electronic devices present the greatest risk in terms of all three distraction subtypes. There was a, a survey done, um, published in the Journal of uh, Journal Pediatrics, where a little over 50% of teen drivers uh, on a, a, an anonymous survey reported text messaging within the last month. So think about that. Half of the drivers, no matter what messaging we've sent or what the laws are, report that in the last month they sent a text message while driving. And this was sort of a wake-up call for many of us in the public health field about how to combat this, this uh, growing issue. The strongest predictor of crash risk is actually duration of glances away from the road. So it doesn't matter what they're looking at or what they're doing. When a driver takes their, their, their visual contact off the road and looks somewhere else, that's the strongest predictor of any that they're going to get into a crash or be involved in a near crash event. And we know that that time for looking away from the road, that magic number is about two seconds. After two seconds, there's about a five and a half fold increased risk of crash, 5.5 times the risk of a crash or near crash event. Think about other things that might um, get us into danger um, with a 5.5 fold increased risk um, and how, how incredibly telling that is. 
um, I'm going to show this video here. Hopefully it works. And it's it's not for dramatic effect, but it's to show you. These are videos done by, um, by AAA, um, and they're representative of studies that are actually completed where we watch teen drivers who have uh, near crash events. So in, in each of these instances, um, none of these teens were harmed, but these are near crash events where one section of the screen is looking at the road and the other is a, a camera in the vehicle. Um, and the teens at the time um, that participated in this study knew that there were cameras present. And I want you to watch both the road, but also think about the time each of these drivers uh, is looking away from the road um, and, and, and how quick two seconds can truly be. So this particular driver is, is texting. You can see the phone present. It's also night. Less than one second, nearly spun off the road. This novice driver applied lipstick, less than two seconds, unable to anticipate a car. This driver has music, a phone present, glanced away from the road for almost three seconds. Again, wound up on the side of the road. That particular driver, less than a second, looked away to fix the phone or put the phone in a charger uh, and again, lost control of the vehicle. So all of that to, to help our teens and to think about when we're teaching them to drive, that it's it's uh, it's not just looking at the phone and being fully texting. It's it's just looking away. It's putting that phone down. It's, it's trying to see who texted you, even if you're going to text them later. Um, seconds really do matter and really do increase the risk um, of horrible things happening. Let's move on to impaired driving. Um, again, less of a problem now because we've made so many advances um, in laws and in enforcement of driving while impaired, but a growing problem. So alcohol being one, we know that teen drivers have a higher risk of involvement in motor vehicle crashes at any blood alcohol concentration compared with older drivers. Um, so even just one drink, even just sips of a drink in an adolescent uh, body based on um, blood surface area can, can put them at higher risk of involvement in a motor vehicle crash. And it's why many um, states, including Massachusetts, have a no tolerance policy for any blood alcohol concentration. There is no legal limit um, here in Massachusetts if someone is in a crash and have a blood alcohol concentration measured and are under the age of 18. Marijuana, a growing problem, and the studies are still growing to help us determine just how big of a problem this is and what we can do with it. But as it becomes more normalized and commonplace, um, it's becoming uh, more common to get behind the wheel. And, and just as um, when alcohol laws were passed and it was okay to, to drink, um, people think that because there are no laws against something that it's okay in any capacity. And now that marijuana is legalized, um, we need to stress the, the lesson that yes, uh, it may be legalized. It's not legal here in Massachusetts for those under the age of 18. And even though it's legalized, it doesn't mean it's appropriate in all scenarios, especially while operating um, vehicles. Um, we know from some prior studies that marijuana does increase that crash risk by about 1.21 times. Um, and it's difficult to study. It's difficult to study because um, it, we're not aware of it. Um, our police are not as aware of it, and, and it's uh, more difficult to measure, and we don't have as many studies looking at um, ways to measure whether someone's under the influence of marijuana at the time of these crashes. Prescription drugs are something else to think about. There are many commonplace prescription drugs that we may not even think about. Um, motility agents um, for GI issues um, can all create drowsiness. Benadryl, we may, we may not think of, but these things can, um, can impair our ability to respond and to drive. Um, and lastly, medical conditions. So ADHD being uh, a big one. We know that teens are already more likely to, to, take, uh, to take risk, to uh, be impulsive. And those of our, our teens who struggle with ADHD um, are a, a unique population that are, are at much higher risk of, of taking risks and getting into crashes. Sports-related concussions, those who have suffered a, a recent concussion, um, may have uh, the inability to, to have the sharpness or, or think as quickly as they can when they do not have a concussion. And so thinking about that um, in relation to when it's safe to get back to driving. 
Um, epilepsy is a big one. Um, there are laws in place um, and there are uh, great programs for those who struggle with epilepsy in terms of when it's safe to drive, but for children who it's undiagnosed um, or who may have breakthrough seizures, also really important to think about. Um, diabetes, another one, those who are um, on insulin or drugs that can lower one's blood sugar um, have to be particularly uh, careful about when they're driving and in good control of their diabetes. So lots of, of issues and lots of risks and lots of, of badness that I've presented. Um, but what can we do about it? What have we done about it? And, and what can we do going forward? So we touched a little bit on graduated driver licensing. So this is probably the most important advancement in terms of laws and programs for teens in the last 25 years. We have now um, been able to enact GDL in all 50 states. And graduated driver licensing um, begins with a supervised driving period. Here in Massachusetts, graduated driver licensing law is called the Junior Operator License Law, or Junior Operator License. And that supervised driving period is a period um, here that we call the learner's permit period. So that's a time when our, our teen driver has to drive with another licensed driver in the vehicle in the seat directly next to them. And they're only allowed to drive during certain times and with that licensed driver there. That's followed uh, in Massachusetts, that's usually a six month period um, by a probationary or an intermediate period where teens are allowed to drive alone, but under um, restricted uh, conditions. Um, those conditions are, are meant to reduce high risk exposure, which we know to be driving at night and passengers. Um, and the effect of graduated driver licensing, how effective these laws are, are actually directly related to how strict these, um, these conditions are. Here in Massachusetts, we have a pretty good graduated driver licensing law, but not the best. We know that nighttime restrictions are, are most effective when they begin um, between 9.30 and 10 p.m. at night, so not allowing these intermediate drivers to drive during that period, and when we don't allow any passengers in the vehicle for at least six months. Um, and here in Massachusetts, it's six months, but the nighttime restriction begins at 12.30 a.m. So there's still that period between 9.30 and midnight that there's still a, a very increased risk of, of crashes for these novice early beginner drivers. Um, this is a, a, a snapshot of Massachusetts graduated driver licensing law. This is the learner's permit restrictions. Um, so we know that learner's permits, um, they're able to get their learner's permit at the age of 16. Um, and anyone who's under the age of 18 may not drive with between midnight and 5 a.m. unless they're accompanied by a parent. Um, they may not operate in another state if it's a violation of that state's law, um, and they must have their learner's permit um, on them when driving. Um, we talked about strong nighttime driving restrictions. 9 p.m. is the, is the best law um, that we have. Um, there are, I believe, five states that have a, a nighttime restriction that begin at 9 p.m. Massachusetts is unfortunately not one of them. Restrictions on teen passengers, and also thinking about the minimum age at which a learner's permit or license can be obtained. Um, we know that that right age is a little bit unknown. Um, the earliest in some states is 15, 15 and a half. Um, here in Massachusetts, that learner's permit can be obtained at 16 with the ability to get a, a, a probationary or junior operator license where teens are allowed to drive alone at 16 and a half or six months after they've obtained that permit. With graduated driver licensing, with um, our junior operator law here in Massachusetts, there is a requirement for driver education. Um, and that is typically a, a period of formal education on the rules of the road that used to happen when I was learning to drive in the classroom. Nowadays, it's more and more happening um, virtually for better or for worse. Um, and those are our courses run by driver's education programs that talk about laws, that talk about general rules of the road um, rather than actual on the road experience. Um, and really what we know about those is... Um, in, in all studies is that they help people pass the road test exams. They don't necessarily lead to our teens being safer on the roads. Um, and again, limited evidence that those programs produce safer drivers. 
Um, what does work for driver's education programs are, are the on-the-road experience, and every state has a different requirement for how many hours are required um, to be behind the wheel with a driver's education program, and then many states also have a requirement for um, driving with a parent that um, parents have to attest to, and we can talk a little bit um, at the end of my talk about how we can um, best maximize that experience when parents are out there with their teens on the road. When we think about other legislation, um, what else has worked? So graduated driver licensing, hugely successful, most successful for 16 and 17 year old drivers. The jury is still out on 18 to 19 year old drivers. And a lot of that is because studies can't really tell if, if people are waiting longer to get their license so they're not um, impacted by GDL laws. Um, or if it's this, this concept of handholding where we just have so many restrictions that when they're finally allowed to drive by themselves at the age of 18, they can't do it. Um, but we do know that it helps the 16 and 17 year olds. And there are many studies trying to determine um, how well they work for our older drivers and how sustained um, that learning is as, as um, teens grow in, in age. Seatbelt laws, um, evidence-based, they do work, they save lives. They need to be primary. A primary law is a law in which um, a law enforcement can pull someone over if they see them or suspect them doing it. Here in Massachusetts, believe it or not, for all of the traffic safety laws that we have, we still do not have a primary seatbelt law. That means here in the state of Massachusetts, you can be ticketed for not having a seatbelt or having a passenger without a seatbelt, but only if you're pulled over for some other offense. Um, and it's subsequently discovered that you didn't have your seatbelt on. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work to try to change that. There's a lot of work um, thinking about how that can be done equitably um, and without bias in terms of who's getting pulled over and when. Um, we also have distracted driving laws. These have been um, very successful, but are, are relatively new in terms of motor vehicle traffic laws. And we'll look shortly um, at some studies that we did here at Mass General for Children at distracted driving laws and which ones actually work and which don't. Um, so we did do a study uh, a couple years ago now. Um, I worked with um, a pediatric critical care fellow, now a pediatric attending here, Michael Salt, um, and my mentor, Dr. Lois Lee, who's a, an emergency medicine physician um, at Boston Children's Hospital. And we wanted to look at um, all of these distracted driving laws that are out there in different states. Um, which ones are actually having any impact um, on those most vulnerable, our teen drivers? And so distracted driving laws come in, in many flavors. Um, we think of them and we grouped them in our study by um, three primary types. Um, for one, there are texting bans. There are states with which explicitly make it against the law to text and drive. And those laws, again, can be primarily enforced if a law enforcement um, person sees you texting or suspects that you're um, texting, they can pull you over that. Uh, pull you over for that, or they can be secondarily enforced. If you get pulled over for some other offense um, and they happened to, to see you texting, you can be ticketed for that. So those are texting bans. Texting bans, as you can imagine, um, where they, they call out just texting are really hard to enforce because a lot of these laws allow for people to um, you know place a phone call or put a, 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 an address into their GPS and being able to determine whether someone was texting or not makes it really difficult for, for law enforcement officials um, to enforce them. There are then handheld cell phone bans, where basically any mobile electronic device are prohibited for use while driving for drivers of all ages. Um, so you can't have anything in your hand. Um, you can't be talking on the phone, but you, you can talk on the phone if you have a hands-free device. So if you have a, a Bluetooth um, headset, if you have Bluetooth available in the vehicle, you're able to talk on the phone. That is not prohibited, but you can't have anything in your hand or to your ear. And then there are laws that um, ban all cell phone use. So you cannot use a cell phone under any circumstances, whether hands-free, whether you're talking on the phone through speakerphone with the phone somewhere else or holding it in your hand. Right now, there is no state in the United States that has one of these bans, except for um, there are some states which ban the use of hands-free devices for all people, um, but only for novice drivers, so only those who are learning to drive. There are no laws on the books for all drivers, and we can think about whether that should change. We looked at um, how have distracted driving laws, um, how have they changed, how have they been implemented uh, over the past decade? We looked back then from 2007 to 2017, 
Um, and you can see the top line is the primary texting ban. The yellow line is all cell phone use bans for novice drivers. So those are the two laws that had the most dramatic increase in enactment across the United States from about 2009 up through 2017. And very steadily, handheld cell phone bans um, are, are um, catching on. So they're slowly increasing. By 2017, there were about five states that had them. Um, thankfully, in Massachusetts, I'll show you shortly, we do have a handheld cell phone ban where it is against the law in Massachusetts for any driver to hold a phone to their ear or have a handheld device um, in their hand while driving. So we were able to look at motor vehicle fatality rates by the type of law. Um, and so here, the higher these bars, the more persons who are um, who are killed while driving in, in a vehicle. Um, and these were for 16, 17, 18, and 19 year old drivers. And we also compared it to, um, I used to say older drivers at 40 to 55, but as I become in that age group, I will say experienced drivers and not call anyone old anymore. Um, and what we notice um, is that um, orange, so the texting bands with secondary enforcement um, don't really work all that well. The lowest bar, which would indicate the fewer um, mortalities, are handheld cell phone bans for all drivers. So across the age spectrum, even for more experienced drivers, we found that handheld cell phone bans worked the best. And that makes sense, right? Um, if you allow... Uh, law enforcement to be able to better enforce the law if you make it clearer for people that, okay, you can put a, a, an address in your GPS, but you can't text, that makes it harder. If you just banned all handheld devices, it seems to work better and, and, and panned it out when we actually looked at the statistics. When we looked at uh, mortality reduction by age group and law type, um, again, um, individual drivers in this, um, higher is better. Again, handheld cell phone bans higher mortality reduction. And when we looked at passengers, so how are passengers impacted by these laws? We found that texting bans um, seemed to be the best. So um, primarily enforced texting, texting bans and secondarily enforced texting bans also had uh, nearly a 40% reduction in passengers being killed while driving with 16 to 19 year old drivers. So um, thankfully, right as this law, as our study came out, um, our governor at the time um, did sign into law back in November of 2019, uh, a cell phone ban while driving law here in Massachusetts. Um, and we continue to wait for more data to be able to determine just how effective that's been or whether that's had any, any impact um, on our teens. What can we do as parents? Um, that's why many of you are here. Um, that's what we think about and feel helpless sometimes in terms of, of allowing our children out there on the roads. Um, but there are things that you can do. There are evidence-based strategies, and we'll, we'll go over them um, here. Um, I will say the most important thing that we can do as parents is serve as role models. There are studies done here at Mass General. There are studies done universally that show that our children learn from us and they pick up our good behaviors, they pick up our bad behaviors. And so as young as the age of two, our children recognize what we do in the vehicle when we're driving with them. And so we may be apt to pick up our phone and answer that text at a stoplight or pick up that phone call for work um, while our children are in the back seat. But that doesn't only place them at risk for a crash um, because it's distracting us. It's also teaching them and showing them that it's okay to use a phone while driving. And so we are first and foremost, their biggest role models and need to set examples for their behavior. Parental monitoring and guidance, adolescents, hate us to monitor them. They hate guidance, but there are things that we can do um, to help um, you know, partner with our teen drivers in terms of monitoring their driving and in terms of helping guide them in terms of setting clear um, and efficient rules for when they go on the road to really recognize that driving is a privilege um, and not a right when you are a teen um, in your home. And there's formal parent training that parents can undergo and we'll talk about all of this um, in just a moment. There are driver monitoring devices um, that are out there. They're called um, dongles. Um, they're devices that plug into the port in your vehicle, that same port where when you get a driver inspection, um, the um, inspectors uh, plug their computers into that can feed um, smartphones all sorts of data from vehicles in terms of how fast the car is going, where the car is located, whether there have been any quick stops um, or erratic driving conditions. 
Um, insurance companies are starting to use some of these to um, not yet penalize drivers, but to reward drivers um, who don't have high risk driving conditions. But these same devices also exist for parents um, to monitor their teens. And we have to be a, a little more cautious about using things like that um, and how we talk about our teens with them. Um, above all, there is a physician uh, by the name of Dr. Winston, um, who does a lot of motor vehicle crash research. Um, and, and she, in many of her studies, advocates for something called precision prevention. Precision prevention. Precision prevention is a tiered approach. It's where we utilize robust graduated driver licensing laws, which exist now in all 50 states, and partner with those laws with tools that help support parents. These laws are only good if we know about them. They're only good if parents know about them and can help teens um, to abide by those laws and can also enforce them themselves. And so they developed something called the Checkpoints Program, which is a parent-teen driving agreement. It's used to help parents um, monitor teen driving. Um, it's been used to bolster parental restrictions on teen driving behavior and, and help to reduce some of those re um, risky driving conditions. This is an example of the Checkpoints website. It's also available as an app. Um, and I'm going to include that um, at the end of my slide. It's also listed here. It's through the University of Michigan. Um, the website is youngdriverparenting.org. It's a free, um, free to download. So they have teen driving rules. You can look up those rules by state. Um, you're also, you have the ability to add your own rules in there for your teen driver. They have the parent rules, so what restrictions or rules have you set forth um, for your particular teenager, and then they have consequences that you can put in writing. So if you don't abide by this, if you don't come home here, what are the consequences um, or the punishments that you're um, putting in place for your teenager? And there are checkpoints where you review um, how things are going, the nighttime driving, whether they're allowed passengers, what the conditions are and how we change each of those things, those rules, those consequences at each of these checkpoints that can happen. So it includes rules, consequences, and, and times to sit down and review with the teen driver what's gone well and when we can allow them to advance to the next point based on their behavior and based on their abiding by the rules that are out there. Um, Life360 is another application out there. I believe it comes at a small cost. It does come with one of these dongle devices where you um, do have the ability to not only monitor speed limits, but actually set speed limits um, remotely from an app. Um, it can alert you in real time um, whether teen drivers are uh, going above a set speed limit that you can put in the app, um, where they are, whether um, there have been any erratic uh, um, maneuvers that the, the equipment has sensed in the vehicle in real time. You can imagine, um, you know, just as some of the monitoring devices we have for infants drive us crazy as parents because there can be false alarms and um, it can just add to our, our own anxiety. These also have the possibility of inducing anxiety, especially when not all of the alerts might be real. They also, you know, introduce a new era of, of, um, of what some term a, a nanny state of, of you know, how much autonomy do we allow our teens? And, and so having a frank discussion and, and not doing this in secret is, is one recommendation that we have as pediatricians if this is going to be implemented. Um, and it really should be used with one of these checkpoint programs where um, if things are going well, um, there is an advancement to you know, remove some of the restrictions or some of the monitoring. And also if they're not, that consequences are laid out in advance um, and that they're followed through, to, through upon by the parent or guardian. Uh, Mama Bear is another worry-free parenting app that provides alert to parents when the teen is texting while driving. So it can actually pair with the teen's phone and um, and monitor whether that phone has been utilized while the while it's in motion. Um, it allows parents to set speed limits and alerts them when they exceed those limits. Um, and it also uh, sets the notifications for arrival and departure notifications. Um, I like the Mama Bear app because it's a little less invasive um, and you can pick and choose which of these you use um, and which ones might be most beneficial for you and your teen driver. Um, again, I, I think it requires um, having a frank discussion with disclosing what you're doing and what the expectations are and, and more importantly, what the consequences are um, if these things occur. Um, Drive Smart is another app. Um, with score metrics. It's not one that gives you alerts, but it is one that records all of this data so it can be reviewed at a later time, which some parents find really helpful. It feels less invasive in the teenager's life. 
Um, but it does allow you to sit down with your teen and look through and say, uh, it looks like overall, you know, these were the speed limits that you, um, this is your average speed. This was your average score for risky maneuvers or having to stop abruptly um, and sort of um, make changes after the fact um, for the appropriate teens. I will say above all, you know, a lot of these apps come with the cost, no, not only monetary cost, but also ensuring that you maintain trust with your teen driver. Um, many of our phones, in fact, all of our phones, Android um, or Apple devices, uh, the majority of us have one of those two. They have the ability to put our phones in a driving mode. Unfortunately, it's an active restriction, meaning you have to go in and put it on. I have it set for myself um, as a researcher. I, I, I have to abide by some of these things. And so I put it on my own phone, but it senses when the phone is in motion or in a vehicle. Um, and one of the most important things it does is it, it doesn't allow any phone calls or notifications to come through while the phone is in the car. So we try to encourage parents, we try to encourage teens when they get in the car, put the phone away, put it in a glove box, put it in the center console. It's really hard to do. Some of us rely on our phones for GPS. Um, and what these features in Android and Apple phones do when you put them on these do not disturb or safe driving modes is they prevent notifications from coming through. Because even if we don't want to answer the phone, even if we don't text while drive, it becomes a distraction just to see that notification come through the screen, to hear it, um, to hear the phone ring. And, and this knows when the vehicle is in motion, um, and it doesn't allow any of that to come through until it senses the vehicle has stopped, which is really helpful to prevent anyone from from. Um, you know, feeling like they have to look or have to answer that phone. So what can we do um, as pediatricians? What's our role here? How can we help parents? One again is that parents driving and behavior, including seatbelt use. I talked a lot about what you're doing with your phone, but everything we're doing on the road from expletives at other drivers um, to road rage, um, it's, it's sensed by our children. They pick up what we do, they learn from us. And so starting at a young age, putting that seatbelt on, not using wireless technology, um, keeping um, the expletives at other drivers, especially here in Boston to a minimum, um, we are the most powerful role models for our children. The other is identifying adolescents. This is both a parent role and a pediatrician role, but knowing who has the acute conditions that we talked about, ADHD, epilepsy, diabetes, um, these don't mean these teens can't drive safely. It just means they might need a different plan. They may need a different approach. They may need a little longer period uh, in terms of restrictions. They may need a little more monitoring and observation and being able to identify these drivers ahead of time helps set forth expectations and helps make everyone safer, um, including others on the road. Um, and, you know, we all as pediatricians should know what our state specific laws are. Um, and this is the leading cause of death, one of the leading causes of death in our patient population. And so just as we counsel our patients on vaccines, um, on um, safe sex, on all of these things that cause diseases, we're also responsible for counseling our patients on, on safe driving, on what it means to have a driver's license and the responsibility that comes with it, and what our state specific laws are to keep people safe. Um, avoidance of distracted driving and responsible use of technology. We need to continue to, to hit home that point. And in terms of counseling our adolescents, um, seatbelt use, the risks of, of, of illicit substance use while driving, and recognizing what medications our, our adolescent uh, patients are using and whether they are risky um, or must not be used while those patients are driving. Um, and we also need to encourage parents to practice driving with their teens. We know that this is state required. Here in Massachusetts, there are a minimum number of hours required that parents have to attest to. Um, but we can encourage parents that, that that's a, a minimum. You know, the state requires a minimum, but there can't be um, too many hours um, other than, you know, making our own hair turn gray or increasing our own blood pressure in terms of helping our, our adolescent drivers get out there on the road safely and practicing with them. Um, those minimum hours are only as good as how we spend them and making sure that um, we spend them well, that we're um, attuned to what they're doing and that we um, we ensure that we're actually um, spending that time to practice with them. So big conclusions, driving is a skill. Um, it's a one of the largest pieces of equipment, the largest death traps that we give our teenagers. Um, and there's a huge responsibility and privilege that comes 
with that giant piece of machinery, both to themselves, to the other people on the road, to the pedestrians and cyclists on the street. And just as we would think about any other product that can induce injury, vehicles are those products. We need to be careful um, and make sure that our, our teens are aware of that. Teens in particular um, face many unique risks. We talked about inexperience. We talked about risk-taking, distraction, um, increased sensitivity to being impaired and all of these driving behaviors, and we need to be aware of them, we need to counsel our teens on them, and we need to set um, expectations and consequences that are clear before we let them out on the road. We know the adolescent brain combined with social and emotional pressure, um, it influences their ability to appraise risk, to think about what split decisions they're gonna make and how they're going to make them. Um, and being aware of that, um, helps us to better counsel our teen drivers uh, and better help them to make the right decisions. And we know that policies and programs, they exist, they work, and continued advocacy from public health professionals, from parents, will help to continue help, will help to continue keep our teens safe on the roads and keep everyone else on our roads um, safe. Um, and all programs are dependent on active participation by parents or guardians for success. We are their role models. Um, we are there to help them. Um, despite uh, what you may think about your adolescent, they still uh, look to us um, as, as the, the biggest influence in their lives, and, and we need to use that influence in the right ways. Here are some resources which I'm happy to share with folks um, later on. There are healthychildren.org resources. There are resources uh, right here from the Clay Center uh, at MGH, um, which talks a lot about parent role models and some studies done there with Liberty Mutual, looking at just how important the effect is that we can have on our, our, um, our children. Um, so these are great for those who have teens that are driving or are gonna drive soon. Here are my children. They're only eight months and two and a half years of age at the moment, but I dread the day that they're gonna be going to get their license and I'm already gray from taking care of them. So I can only imagine what that will be like knowing what I know. Um, but they are, are and continue to be my inspiration, as well as my wife, Danielle, and my my little dog, Wally, who you may have seen blurred out in the background today. Um, and of course, I couldn't be where I am without my mentors, the people who allow me um, to do this each and every day and spend this time um, trying to make an impact out there. So thank you. Um, and with that, I would love to spend the last 10 minutes taking some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. That was fantastic. Um, and we do definitely have some questions. Um, the first one is other than telling uh, kids to put the phone in the back seat so there's no temptation to call or text, uh, do you have other tips for making sure the phone is out of reach for temptation, especially when it's being used maybe for a GPS or um, other things like that? Yeah, you know, it's hard because the laws in Massachusetts allow um, handheld devices. There are um, limitations. You can use it still for a GPS. Um, you can use it still to make hands-free phone calls. My guidance and recommendation is always that a phone has no place in the vehicle. And there really needs to be a zero tolerance policy for that. Um, and the teaching needs to be that the phone needs to go somewhere and we shouldn't be using it under any circumstances, not for a GPS, not to make hands-free phone calls. Those can all be done outside of the vehicle. Um, other than putting the, the phone out of reach, I think, again, it's really important to put it in that do not disturb mode to make sure that our teen drivers have it in the um, the safe driving mode so that even if they forget to put it somewhere, they're not tempted by notifications coming through or by that phone ringing when they're supposed to be paying attention to the road. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Our next question is, uh, this person has a teenager who takes her eyes off the road to change lanes to look in her blind spot spot but it feels like she does it for more than two seconds. Is that considered safe or unsafe? Oh boy. Um, I would say anytime your eyes are off the the, the road um, looking in front of you, um, it's unsafe, especially when it's more than two seconds. It's hard because again, um, yeah. teens especially don't have the ability to anticipate, to sort of think about all of of the things in front of them. So while we are able to glance in that rear view mirror or actually look behind us, um, to change lanes and know what's in front of us, teens are unable to anticipate that. So I would encourage her and, and help um, or him um, or them to utilize their mirrors um, and, and really teach them to be able to, to look in that side mirror um, to check their blind spot um, and or to find a vehicle with blind spot monitoring or aftermarket devices or to try to limit how much time is spent looking away. Excellent. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is, is it dangerous to let teens drive in Boston or other uh, densely populated cities because of the population density? Yeah, so that's a difficult question. You know, we know that universally the risk of a crash in a teen driver increases per mile driven and whether that mile is in a rural area or an urban area, um, it really depends. There are rural areas that don't have the same speed limit limitations and where it becomes a little bit more um, tempting to, to go faster, where even though it's open and less dense, the risk is actually greater. So I would say that, that these risks exist in all settings and that risk is, is probably the same universally and the most important thing we can do is practice. And so if your teen is gonna drive in the city, if they're gonna be around Boston, um, there needs to be more time spent practicing what it's like to drive in a highly populated area where people are crossing the street, um, where there are drivers uh, doing all sorts of uh, egregious things. Um, practice is, is what's most important uh, no matter the location. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I know you touched on this a little bit um, in your presentation, but maybe you could expand on it. Um, should kids with ADHD wait longer to learn how to drive? Yeah, so the answer to that question really relies on your particular teen driver. Um, it depends on um, how well controlled that ADHD is um, and how they're performing in other aspects of life. And so it's a very individualized decision. I think the most important thing that we can know is to acknowledge that we have a teen driver who's been diagnosed for struggles with ADHD um, and to individualize the training to that particular driver. There are some teens with ADHD who will do fine under the current um, guidance from the state and under the current junior operator laws. And there are others who may need a little bit longer of a time to, um, to practice, more hours spent in the road with driver's ed, more hours spent with a parent. Um, and more restrictions in terms of introducing distraction um, or things that may impact their, their impulsiveness. So it, it depends. It needs to be individualized, but identifying it and knowing that our children uh, or we have a child with ADHD um, helps us become a little more aware of what we need to do. And, and I think that we tailor that, that training to our individual child. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Um, Next question is, what is the rationale behind the age of uh, 16 for teenagers to get a license if their brains are still developing into their early and mid-20s? Oh, great question. Um, if it were up to me, we would wait till the, the late 20s. Um, this is a difficult question to answer because so many um, things in our lives have age limits that uh, seem a little arbitrary. You know, we can enlist our children in the military at the age of 18. Um, we can, uh, but they can't drink till they're 21. And, and where do these numbers come from? There is a history to the driving age um, that began in the early 1900s um, when we actually first started requiring licenses in general to drive. Uh, but in the 1920s, there was something called the Uniform Vehicle Code that came out where they recommended that um, people actually wait until the age of 16 to drive. And that sort of was carried forward through the decades um, where it became a, a rite of passage and the age that we've used uh, in most states. Um, you're right, most Children, I will say, are probably not ready to drive at the age of 16, and um, it's why many parents are choosing to wait, um, and it's why if we do um, allow our children to drive at 16 and a half per these laws, that um, there are lots of protections and things we need to do to ensure they can do it safely um, and in the right stepwise approach. Great. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how would you recommend families um, to start modeling safe driving behaviors if it's something that they maybe haven't done before or it's something that they aren't sure where to start um, because those habits are kind of well ingrained? Yeah, it's never too late. Um, and I think, again, there are a lot of passive things that we can do every day that our, our, um, our children and our teenagers that they'll observe, even without um, calling it out specifically. And those are making sure you put your seatbelt on right when you get in the car, uh, making sure that you put the phone away and that our children see us put it away, and then just not engaging in those behaviors. Um, and then as our children age, I think it's really important to call out what you're doing um, and sort of make it um, explicit. I'm putting my seatbelt on. We always put our seatbelt on as soon as we get in the vehicle, um, no matter how fast we're going, no matter if we're going down the driveway or we're going on the highway. Um, I'm getting in the car. I'm putting my phone away because the phone has no place in the car. I can, you know, answer this phone call or talk to grandma later. Um, and, and they listen to this, they hear this, and I think it's never too late to start, even if we haven't been great at it, and we're all guilty, including myself, of, of these bad habits. 
but being cognizant and, and understanding what we're doing is the first step um, and then trying our best to avoid it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let me just check our chat box one last time. Um, no, it looks like we've answered all the questions um, and we are wrapping up right on time. So uh, thank you so much, Mike. This is um, a fantastic presentation as always. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who joined. It was a, an honor to be here. All right. Thank you so much.